years. Um, some of these actually vaccinate eggs. And let's face it, you guys don't have the technology or <laughs> want to buy that type of equipment. So in a lot of times, it's going to be better for you to buy animals that are already vaccinated if you have diseases you're concerned about. So I throw that out there to say there's a lot of diseases that you don't have to be worried about. But if you're going to be potentially, you know, selling chicks or raising layers or you know, broilers, those types of things, it changes. So you just need to know what your needs are, specifically what you're looking to target, how you're looking to develop this. And again, the, the more that you can do to talk to a veterinarian ahead of time, the more successful you'll be. So my goal today is really for you to walk away with some tangible things to think about. If you don't have chickens, or if you do have chickens, maybe some ways to make it a little bit less likely that you have to see somebody like me. Because I'm expensive, and if you can avoid that type of you know, intervention, just managing your poultry a certain way, that's going to be better for everybody. So um, if any of you want to, are interested in sheep and goats, llamas, populated pigs, I just did a presentation on that. That actually was recorded. We did the same type of thing with legalities because if you didn't know, you can only have up to five chickens if you live in the, the city of Kalispell. And you can't have roosters. And if you do and you don't have a good relationship with your neighbors, guess what's going to happen? They're going to call and they're going to complain and then you're going to run into trouble. So it's one of those, just be aware, if you have chickens, and you have too many, you may run into trouble. If you don't have chickens and you're thinking about getting them, know what your limits are. And if you don't live in any of our cities, because Whitefish has the limit of no chickens, just really depends upon where you are. So look, look it up. We, we talked about it the last time, you can get on the different ordinance sites for our cities and they'll have it listed right there. Um, but if you live out outside of any of our cities, there's really nobody that's going to limit the type of animals that you have other than the predators that you have. <laughs> so the other thing I will say is HOAs often also have very specific limitations. So if you live in a neighborhood outside of any of our cities, you may still have um, some issues to think about. So just some quick facts. Um, chickens typically live for about five years. I say that um, that average is really more about the commercial poultry business. Often those chickens don't even last past two and a half or three years, especially if they're layers. I mean, they're laying eggs every single day and that's their only job and, and if they start to die off you know the, the egg production then that's going to be the end of it. So you know it is to be aware of that I, I have friends that have had chickens for eight or nine years but let's be honest they were pets. She had like a little vest that she would put on the back of her chicken to make sure that the hawks didn't come down and catch it. I mean so like again the more you baby these animals again the longer that they're going to last. So just be aware of that. Um, as I have here, egg laying starts at six months, but we really don't want to push that. So we want them to start to take their time and start to lay when they're ready. Um, we'll talk a little bit about just some husbandry things that can impact the chicken itself. And early egg production is actually a negative thing. So we don't want to push this if we don't have to just let them start to lay eggs and be expecting that it's going to be around six months of age. Often they're very tiny eggs. So you know, you're going to go, oh, this isn't what I was expecting. And it's just because of the age of the chicken. Uh, if anybody is looking to raise meat chickens, or let's say that you have allowed some eggs to hatch and you ended up with some roosters, I can say from experience, don't wait to eat them because by the time they get to be like a year and a half, they are tough. <laughs> they are not, they're like soup chickens at that point. So if you're thinking about, oh, you know, I'm just going to raise these birds and they're going to be, you know, for, for our consumption, because their roosters just realize that, that the, be the, the better quality meat is going to be the younger animal. Now, that being said, four to five months of age is about the commercial growers, and they're really making sure that they're providing the maximum feed for these animals to get the maximum growth. So you're not going to get the same quality chicken that you're picking up at the store if you're raising it at home. It's not going to have the same quality meat. I should say quality, but quantity. So, you know, if you think about the breast, I mean, if you go to Europe, the chicken breasts are like half the size and they're laying eggs. I'm hoping that you're not rinsing them off. You should be picking them um, up out of the nest and just brushing the debris off and putting them like into a cool area. And they'll, they'll last for several weeks, if not months. You can also dip them in mineral oil or like candle wax, and that will increase the longevity of these eggs if you don't wash them. If you wash them and then you do these things, that allows bacteria to get in and it's much more likely that they'll spoil.
But if yeah. you've just, you know, like I say, brushed them off, you made sure that they look pretty clean, and then you dip them in candle wax, they'll actually last for three to six months. So this is some of the things that, if you're interested in, like, <laughs> I don't mean to be negative and imply this in any way, but if you're interested about prepping and like being prepared and those things like that, that's often how people will handle some of these eggs if they have their own chickens. And the last thing I have on here is that chickens do like a certain ambient temperature. I think like we do. And it's pretty close to what I like to live at, <laughs> 65 to 75 degrees. So if you don't have chickens, or if you do have chickens, think about how well you maintain that type of temperature when it's really cold or really hot. Because those are gonna be the times that we think about how we're gonna ventilate what the coop that we have and how we're gonna keep them warm. All right? So I thought I'd just throw up a slide that shows you some of the various types of breeds. Let's be honest, there's a lot of them. Um, they have various sides of eggs. I, I do have to laugh because here in the United States, we use white eggs more often than not. Anywhere else in the world, it's usually brown eggs. And if you look, most of these breeds of chicken produce brown eggs. So you're probably going to end up with brown eggs, um, unless you have Americanas and then you have all kinds of colors. So um, again, they taste the same as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not a connoisseur of chicken eggs, but I think they all taste good. <laughs> so. All right, have we got their pictures? No. Okay. All right. So one of the questions that a lot of people ask is where do you get birds from? And part of what I want you to walk away with is understanding that the quality of the chicken that you get is going to be dependent upon where you get it from. So if you're just buying chickens from the person down the street and you know nothing about those chickens, then you're going to bring whatever diseases they have into your flock. And your flock should be the primary thing that you're concerned about, the health of your flock. Because if you're keeping them healthy, again, you never need to see somebody like me. They're going to go along just fine. There is a program that the USDA runs called the National Poultry Improvement Program. And this is basically for any avian species, anything from chickens up to ostriches. And it's a, a certification program that hatcheries can go through. You can actually go through and get certified if you want, if you are looking to you know, again, sell chickens or eggs that are intended for hatching, those kinds of things. Um, it has then certainly standards that are expected of the US, from the USDA on how you're gonna manage your animals. And at the end of the day, that's really, as much as you don't necessarily want government involvement, you do wanna know that there's a certain standard that these animals are gonna be held to before you bring them to your property. So it is worthwhile to know that you're purchasing from a hatchery that is NPIP certified. Now, Dr. Gates, who actually is on my list at the very end, she is somebody who can certify um, different areas and different flocks in this area. So if you have that interest, she's somebody that you should probably talk to. Um, again, for me, it was more just making sure that you were aware that that program is out there. If you have you know, a handful of chickens, you don't have to worry about this. It's more about the source of where you're going to be getting chickens from. Um, health certificates are something that an accredited veterinarian needs to do for you. So there is a difference between somebody who is a veterinarian and then somebody who's an accredited veterinarian. That means that we've gone on and understand the legalities that are required here in Montana for transportation of animals and health of animals. So if you're going to take your chickens to 4-H and up to the fairgrounds in August, you need to have health certificates for those animals. So just be aware that that is something that's out there that you need to investigate before you pursue that. And then the last two things I have on here is if you currently are um, have chickens and you're selling eggs, and I have to say I didn't know this until I did a little research, uh, that safe handling instructions, the FDA requires all of us to put that on our chicken eggs as we sell it. Eggs. Eggs, yes. So even though you may, like there's different ways that um, backyard, uh, commerce is handled, so you may not need specific licenses or specific allowances to have the business that you have. They, they call it cottage industries. You can sell honey and things like that. Eggs actually still have this warning that you're supposed to be putting on them if you're selling eggs. So just FYI. I don't know who would come after you personally. I, I just but <laughs> I figure it's worth sharing this. And then the other thing I did put on here is about the storage of eggs. If you're going to be selling them, they have to be maintained at a temperature at 45 degrees. <coughs> the other thing that I wanted to point out, um, prior to 2019, I guess it was, 
Um, it used to be that you could go to Murdoch's or you could go to TSC, whatever farm store is in your area, and you could pick up tetracycline powder, you could pick up um, LA-200, which is a um, oxytetracycline, you could pick up various things that you could use for your chickens. But the FDA has cracked down on that now. And now you need to have a veterinary relationship before you can use antibiotics. And that's because of judicious use. They're trying to make sure that antibiotics are being used appropriately so that we don't end up with these superbugs that we can't control with antibiotics. And so they want veterinarians to be able to guide you as to what is appropriate use of these different products. So um, that's where the veterinary feed directive comes in. So there's been huge changes in what's available in the feed of chickens. The other thing I have on here is farad. That's something that I would use as a veterinarian. If you were saying to me, oh, I have this parasite in my chickens, and I think, okay, well, I'm gonna use this type of dewormer, but it's not labeled for chickens. Again, you guys aren't necessarily worried about that, but what can happen is that that um, anti, that the dewormer, excuse me, can then cross over into the eggs, and it can expose you to the dewormer. And now I need to be aware of that. So I need to know what, what's called residues, it can happen for meat and for eggs. And so if I tell you, oh yeah, use ivermectin for your chickens to take care of this parasite, but don't eat those eggs for three weeks, that's where that information is gonna come from. And this is actually a database that's maintained by a lot of vet schools. Um, so it's just available to the veterinarian. And that's again, the resource that, that a veterinarian would provide to you. So we're gonna take, spend some time talking about housing and management. Um, I think that this is probably one of the biggest questions, is if you don't have chickens right now, how do you build your coop? What does this look like over time? How can I do the best job for my animals? Um, I didn't include the slide here, but I will say for bedding, I mean, the, the perfect coop would have a concrete floor, and it would have double wire going around it, and it would have the ability to ventilate the, the area very well, but also keep it warm in the winter, which I don't know if a perfect, <laughs> if that is a perfect, uh, um, if it's even possible to achieve that perfection. But the bedding that people will use also matters. So I think pine shavings is probably the most common that I hear about pe people using, or straw. Uh, both of them are pretty decent. You don't want to use hardwoods. Um, so that would be, you know, I mean, again, most of the time you see something here, it's going to be pine. But cedar is really not great for chickens at all because it's very aromatic. It can cause respiratory issues for them. Um, other hardwoods like oak and things like maple, that can, they can carry fungus and bacteria that, again, you just don't want to expose your animals to. Um, the other thing I've heard people using <laughs> is sand. I think sand can be very problematic. It also isn't going to do a great job. Um, the, the big deal is that you are maintaining the cleanliness of your coop. So no matter what you're using, that you're out there as much as you can every day to try and keep it clean. Because over time, it gets really smelly, especially in the, in the summertime, and that affects the respiratory systems of these birds and ultimately can cause additional problems for you. So cleanliness is an issue. You're going to get chicks in. I don't know if anybody, has anybody ever ordered chicks through the mail? No? So I have to say my, um, <laughs> my, cousin's, uh, my husband's cousin was the postmistress, and we ordered chicks. And she called us at six o'clock in the morning and said, come get these stinking birds because they're making so much noise. Because they come and they're about a day old and they're going ding, 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 ding. And, and so you're like, oh, oh my gosh. You know, so you buy like 25 or whatever. They send a couple extra typically. You never know if you're gonna get any roosters or not. They do their best. Um, but that's how they'll arrive. And so you need to know they need to be kept someplace warm. 95 degrees is a really high temperature if you're not thinking about it. It's not gonna be easy this time of year to maintain 95 degrees in a barn. They're going to be in your garage, in your kitchen, in your dining room, so that you can keep them warm from the very beginning. And so then typically for the first 24 hours, they don't get fed, so then they're going to come to you, and so then you're going to have to start to make sure that you have chick feed, and that you have waters, that you have the ability to set up a brooding ring like this. So in the center, where that diamond is, is going to be the heat lamp. And then around there, there's the, the waters and the feed. And so... You know, you think about that, and sometimes you'll see pictures. I, again, this if I go out to a, if I, so I was in practice. I just saying I didn't practice. I'm not practicing here, but when I practiced in Pennsylvania before I moved here years ago, um, I would have like some people who would show me pictures, or I go out to see the farm, and all the chicks would be right under the heat lamp. Well, that's the first sign that it is too cold. 
you, know, you want them to be able to move about freely. They shouldn't be all huddled under the heat lamp. It's too high at that point. You want to drop it down or add another heat lamp. So it's just, again, paying attention to what the birds are doing and understanding what they might need. This is not a bad time of year potentially to get <laughs> chicks as long as you can keep them inside. Um, because you're thinking about, okay, when is it going to be warm enough to start to move them outside? So you want to wait about six weeks. Well, okay, middle of April, you know, end of April, not a bad time to start moving animals outside as long as you have the ability to bring them inside and they can stay warm. And again, they're, you know, they're going to be choosing where they want to be, all right? So those are the types of things you don't want to be picking these animals up in December and then thinking, oh, I have to keep them inside until April. That's a really long time. So think about those types of things. Um, space, I, again, this might be something that you just take a picture of or think about. Um, there is a certain requirement for square footage for maintaining these birds. And it's not uh, like hard and fast. It's more if you start to crowd the birds a little bit more, you're going to have more problems. So more cannibalism might be happening. You might have animals that aren't getting along as well. Um, you might have uh, additional illness that if you just gave them a little bit more space, you, you won't see um, the issue as, as much. Um, and I do have on here that it should increase with the bird's age. So we're looking at the maximum at the very end. So 18, eight, 18 weeks of age, you're looking at 377 square inches for the floor space for birds. Again, this is commercial requirements typically, but they're trying to let you know what works well mm -hmm. overall. All right. There's also this thing about light. So I don't know if any of you have ever had chickens before. As we get to the fall, they stop producing eggs. And that's because their bodies are saying, oh, it's getting cold. Why would I want to make eggs? I'm not going to raise babies at this time of year. So if you want them to keep producing eggs, you need to supplement that light. right? And that's what this chart is representing. So towards the end of their, like, so let's say we get to July. Well, I know the light's going to start dropping off. I'm going to start to supplement their light during that time so I can make sure they're going to continue to lay. <coughs> but I do want to also respect the fact that they need a break. So there's going to be a time where they need to molt. And it's about a month. And so, again, you just need to pick that time. Is it October? Is it November? Is it December? What, it, what works for you? And then you don't need to have the lights on because then they'll start to go through that process of stopping laying eggs and molt. All right? But just, again, be aware that if you want to have year-round eggs, one, that's not practical, but two, you do need to have some supplementation to make it so that they're producing more than just the summertime. Nutrition is an important thing. Um, I've seen uh, birds that have, they're over-conditioned, so, and we're going to talk about, um, well, there's a body score system in just a minute, um, but if you are using the wrong type of feed, so let's say that you have layers and you're giving them chick feed, they're not getting the right calcium that they need. They're getting too many calories. You're gonna end up with a fat bird that's not gonna be producing eggs because she just doesn't have, and she's just overweight and it just doesn't work well. So those are the types of things to be aware of. You don't always necessarily think that um, eggs have a lot of water in them, but they're about 60% water. And so the water requirements for layers is much higher than a chick. And so again, you need to be aware that I need to put more waters in if I'm talking about chickens that are producing eggs. So it's just, again, those types of things to think through. I have my chick area looks like this, but my layer area looks like this and it's gonna be different. And it's water. So it's about uh, one part feed to two to four parts water, and it really depends upon what level of production you're at. So again, if we're talking about meat chickens, we only need probably two times the water availability, but if we're talking about layers, we might we, we want to be closer to four times the water. Just a rule of thumb. And they get about a quarter pound of feed a day, layers do. So that's about, what, a gallon of water no, a pound of water, which is eight gallons. I do the math. Um, a lot of people will think, and I should say a lot, people may think that you can save yourself money by going into the store and saying, all right, I'm going to buy this type of food, but I don't want to spend the extra money for the one that already has the premixed minerals and vitamins in it. I want to buy the separate minerals and vitamins myself, and I'm going to mix it myself. Because over time, that'll save me money. 
Well, you need to be aware that a lot of these vitamin mixes only last for about a year, so you may have spent $50 on that mix and only used maybe a couple pounds of it, and then everything else is wasted. Or you're gonna to continue to use it and your birds aren't gonna get the benefit because it will have started to lose the values of its the vitamins and minerals. So just be aware, unless you're talking about a huge number of birds, again, think along the terms of commercial poultry production, this is not going to be an economical way to do it. Your birds will potentially not get the nutrition that they need. So always, I look at this and say, you're always better off spending the money to buy the, the feed that is well balanced. Now, my husband will tell you, we, we had chickens for a long time, and we currently don't have them, because he said, we've never, ever broken even. We always ended up spending more than it would have cost us to buy eggs at the store. Now, it was nice because we had eggs that were fresh. We had them available to us all the time. But if you're going into this, recognize this is a hobby, and you're probably not going to come out ahead. Just, again, setting those, those uh, expectations. As I mentioned, there is a difference between, so on this chart, it has pullet starter versus, you know, what hens might need or roosters. Um, proteins differ, calcium differs, um, even some of the things like sodium differ. So this is why we're looking to make sure that you're giving the appropriate feed for the appropriate level of chicken that you have. For chicks, if you have, let's say you have five chicks, you're never gonna go through a 50 pound bag of feed for chicks. It might be worthwhile to check with some friends and see if you can split a bag. If you're buying you know, 300 chicks, you certainly may go through a 50 pound bag. So again, just set those um, expectations in your own mind and think about how you can make this work. So this is what I was mentioning. There's a, there is a body condition scoring. Feathers can um, sort of uh, give you a false idea of what your chickens look like. So as much as you can, putting your hands on them is important. Um, as you get to these girls that have a lot of flesh along their, their top line, they're not gonna be doing as well for layers and things like that, just because they're storing fat as opposed to focusing on egg production. So we're always looking for the three, the well-conditioned animal. So as I mentioned, you know, we talk about over-conditioning. This obese chickens just don't have great egg laying potential. Um, and they're gonna have more fat than they are muscle. Again, they're not gonna be great birds to eat either. So you just need to, again, think about the quality of the animal and what you're planning on doing with it. Um, you certainly, if you have a poor diet, you're gonna end up with an obese animal that's not laying. It just, that's, if you're giving them chick feed, it's too much protein, it's too many other things that they don't need. As I mentioned, cannibalism. So this is a real thing. Chickens will go after other chickens. And sometimes it's just, as I said, pecking order on that one slide, it, it's a real thing. There's the top chicken and there's the bottom chicken and the bottom chicken is gonna get bullied. And so you just need to figure out how you manage some of this. Sometimes it's you have to separate them. Sometimes, you know, you get rid of certain chickens. It, it's unfortunate, but this does happen, but it's more likely to happen if they don't have enough space. So if you have the ability to give them the space to, you know, again, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this with dogs or cats in your own household. If you have two different rooms for them to go to, that's always better. It's the same for chickens. Yes? What, what age will that uh, progressively start? It can start early. It really can start early. So even as they start to get their feathers, so the chicks start to grow, they'll start to figure out the pecking order for sure. Wow. Okay. Um, and so the last thing I have on here is egg issues. So, as I said, we don't want them starting really early to produce eggs. We want them to, so we don't want to force that. Um, but the other thing is that we want to make sure that if we're seeing egg issues, so soft eggs or eggs that have a really thick shell or a wavy shell, that we're looking for the opportunity to correct those. And often those are dietary. So if you know, that would be the time that you start to say, ooh, am I, do I have the right feed? Do I have the right, um, you know, uh, ratio of vitamins and minerals do I need to put more you know calcium out there for them to to pick around so all of those types of things okay all right I would be remiss if I didn't talk about biosecurity so biosecurity is just a big word to say try to protect your flock and don't bring diseases in so if I already have a flock and I'm looking to get more birds I need to th be thinking about where I'm getting these birds from, what kind of testing there might be done um, prior to bringing these birds in, what am I worried about as far as um, parasites or, or all of these things, okay? So what does that look like when I'm going to purchase these birds? But also once I'm thinking about my own flock, 
Um, we're going to talk about um, highly pathogenic avian influenza in a minute. I have a couple slides on that because it, it's going to be a problem this year. If I can prevent people from bringing in diseases to my chickens, that's also a really important thing. When we're talking about sheep and goats and, and those animals, we think about transportation. Like, what does it look like to get those animals there? And what could those vehicles be, be bringing in? Well, that's a real thing for these guys, too. Like, if I'm thinking about um, commercial poultry, they're going from farm to farm. They can be spreading disease. So if I'm buying from a reputable breeder, hopefully they've made sure that they're controlling for those types of things. But if I'm buying from the hatchery down the street and I don't know anything about them, they may not be controlling for these diseases. So just again, do your due diligence. Make sure you know um, more about where these birds are coming from. If, if I have the ability to try and prevent a disease, especially something like HPAI coming into my flock, I'm going to do my best to do that. And that may mean that I have only one pair of boots that I wear into that coop. And I leave that right outside the door in a Tupperware, you know, one of the big tubs. And I pull those out, I change my shoes, I put those boots on, and that's the only thing that I wear when I go in. If I'm really concerned about this, I may also be wearing like a Tyvek coveralls. Because you can unknowingly carry in virus on your clothes. And Again, we'll talk about HPAI a little bit more, but there's other diseases you can also carry in. So the more that you do to try and prevent exposure to your birds, the better. So as I say, in the perfect world, you know, this is what it would look like. If you talk about like swine or poultry places now, these commercial growers, they are, are completely shower and shower out. So if I go in, I have to take a shower, I have to use only their clothes, including underwear, all the way down before I go in to see the animals. And then when I come out, I shower out, and I can put my, my clothes back on and leave. And that's the level of biosecurity that they've gone to because it's a huge deal if they bring in some of these diseases. So think about that. Think about how you can manage your own internal birds. Um, and it doesn't have to be to that level, but it, it is worthwhile thinking about. Um, oh, the other thing that I have on here is disinfect tools or equipment. So, um, I know that they were in here talking about bees earlier. It also applies for bees. Don't buy somebody else's equipment because you are basically buying whatever problem they had. So if they have a coop that they're selling, don't do it. Buy a new one. You know, if you have a property that somebody else had chickens on, don't use that same coop because you just don't. As much as you can avoid doing something that exposes your birds, the better off you'll be. Now, if you're able to sanitize everything, that's great. But I don't know that that's always practical. So, especially if it's on dirt. So, I mean, I don't know how much dirt you'd have to remove to get rid of, you know, whatever diseases might have been in that coop. So, just keep that in mind. The other thing that I do always recommend with any animal species, including dogs and cats, is um, that you quarantine your animals before you expose them to the animals you have. So. Ideally, it's 30 days. I don't know if anybody has ever adopted a cat and already had cats, and they tell you to keep the cat separate and let them you know, have some time. It's the same idea. <coughs> keep your birds separate. Make sure that they have time to show you how healthy they are. And once you've established that, then you can start to mix them in. Also, understand that the likelihood of issue um, is going to be, like the, the cannibalism, that kind of stuff is going to be much more likely as you start to mix birds. So if you have the opportunity to slowly introduce them or have a place for them to get separately, um, if you've ever seen like some of these places, they'll have like areas where the chicks can get away from the rest of the flock as they start to introduce them. That, that's a great idea just to avoid some of this bullying. Uh, if you have sick animals, please isolate them. Please take them out of your flock and put them someplace else. And then as you're thinking about how you're gonna, so let's say you know your morning routine is I went out and I fed the chickens and then I came off and did something else. Now I have a separate bird that's sick. Well, don't treat the sick bird until after you've treated everybody that's healthy because you don't wanna take whatever that sick bird has back into the flock as much as you can avoid it, all right? So the removal of sick birds quickly is uh, important. So free ranging, um, I am not a fan of free ranges, ranging. There's a few reasons why, but the big one is that I just can't control what my birds are exposed to then. And as we get into HPAI, that will become much more clear as to why it's a big deal. Um, the other thing is predators. Um, predators are out all the time. 
And so if my chickens are out and they're going around my whole house, uh, even my cat could go after one of my chickens. So it's just being aware that the risks for these guys when they're free range like that is much higher. Now, if you could, like, again, make a fairly large fenced area for them, people might say, oh, that's free range. Well, it's not really, but it's a, a lot more controlled. And that is, I would be much more comfortable with that, knowing that my birds are a little bit more protected. So I do have a <laughs> slide up here about predation because this is a real thing. I can't tell you how many chickens I've lost to um, the third little picture there, the raccoons. I don't see a ton of raccoons out here, but let me tell you, they are great at reaching through fencing. And what they'll do is just pop the chicken's head off and then you'll find the body. <laughs> You're like, gosh darn it, I thought for sure. I, you know, two, two fences, they're still very adept at getting to chickens. Um, you know, the other things that are mink, weasels, I mean, they'll dig under. The, these guys are really at risk <laughs> for, for animals coming along and picking them off. Um, again, as I said, the, the two fences are great, but if you can bury one down six to eight inches, the outside one, that's even better. I mean, my brother-in-law actually put concrete down <laughs> in his fence there because it stops them from being able to dig through. So this is, this is a real issue. Um, owls, eagles, hawks, you know, so problems from the sky, problems from the ground. <laughs> so we got to do our best to protect these guys. I did put this in here because there's a group called Defenders of Wildlife. Um, and if you decide to get electric, um, they will help pay for this. And this includes for bees. So if you have chickens or bees or even fruit trees, things that might cause some problems with the bears and our interface with them. It, they're looking to try and, and, and help and support us to, to prevent the bears from causing problems. I actually used them a couple years ago for my own bees. Um, when the gentlemen were here about bees before, they were talking about how they can coexist. Bees and chickens can coexist, and that's very true. The chickens will come around and will eat the dead bees from underneath the hives. So it's, you know, it's not either or. You can actually get fencing and put both of them in the same area. I wanted to mention some common diseases um, that we do see with chickens. Um, these are the top three that were most reported uh, when we looked at backyard chickens. So this came from some of our national laboratories that test for different infections with, uh, with chickens. And if you pay attention, basically these are all bacteria or bacteria-like infections. So what you should be walking away with is that are avoidable and they can be prevented. Um, salmonella, I think we all are probably familiar with salmonella and chickens. Um, one of the things that salmonella likes is wet environments. And so if you have waters um, and they feel a little slimy, that often is salmonella and you need to do a better job of cleaning your water systems. You can even have, if you haven't had a water test on your well, you may not know that you have some of these bacteria. I have to say, when I lived on a farm in Pennsylvania, we never had a problem with our water sample, but then we let a couple of friends put cows on our property, and our well was down at the bottom of the field. And over time, we got E. coli into our well because of the cows. So it's just an FYI. You know, if you are, if things are changing, and maybe you're not, I mean, we never were sick, but we had that in our water. And if I brought animals in, it could have caused problems for them. All right. Um, for salmonella and mycoplasma both, you can treat for these diseases, but often you end up with carriers. And so again, prevention is a better, is a much better outcome or to start, you know, instead of trying to treat these guys and then saying, oh, do I keep them? Do I get rid of them? Because carriers, what a carrier means is they'll continue, especially when they're stressed, to then spread that disease in their feces. And so an animal that is susceptible is going to get the disease and they may die. So if you can avoid a carrier state for any of these, that's going to be better. Um, mycoplasma is a reportable disease. So if your vet comes out and says, oh, we've got mycoplasma, that is something they have to report to the state veterinarian. Okay. So what does a sick bird like look like? Um, I have on here that there's a few pathognomonic signs. And pathognomonic means that that sign is only seen with that disease. And so probably the it's just an example, but like when COVID first started and they said, oh, you know, people are losing their sense of taste and smell. There's not a whole lot of other diseases that cause that. And so often they were like, oh, well, that's COVID. It would be a similar idea with chickens. 
very few diseases that you could be like, oh yeah, that's only salmonella, or that's only Merrick's disease, or that type of thing. So you end up having to work your way through, saying, okay, what do the clinical signs look like, and then I have to test, because often we can't, as veterinarians, rule out what these diseases look like. So um, the top couple, that's a, a, a chicken with swollen waddles. Um, we have some bruising on the legs, some discharge from the mouth. Again, just a bird that's sitting there very quietly and sort of stuporous. And then the last picture is actually the liver. But again, this would be a bird that just doesn't look like they're feeling well. So, you know, get familiar with what your normal birds look like. And then you can see that this is not a healthy bird fairly quickly. This is again a picture of a, a chicken with a swollen um, area around the eyes and then the, the comb up at the top. This is a rooster with a little bit of discharge from the, the eye area, but also an open beak um, showing some trouble breathing, so a respiratory disease. And then this is a chicken with some diarrhea. Yeah, sort of nasty looking. Okay, but with diarrhea, often they're gonna have staining on their feathers, so you're gonna be, like, you might be seeing it on the litter, but going, who's having this? Well, just flip them all over and you'll find it pretty quickly. Unfortunately, a lot of times what you end up with dead chickens, and you don't even know. So parasites that are most common in chickens, um, mites or lice, again, these are gonna be ones that you're bringing in from someplace else. They're not just gonna arbitrarily, you know, develop mites or lice. So um, the northern fowl mite, these typically stay on the chicken, and so you're looking at them and you can see them like on the bottom of the chicken typically around the feathers. The red mites aren't always on the chicken, and so they might be ones, they're sort of like bed bugs. They get onto the animal at certain times, but then they're off the animal and in the surrounding litter or, or boxes. So they might be a little bit harder to find. But if you, you know, have chickens that are losing feathers and you're pretty sure that they're not being bullied, that the feathers aren't being pulled out by other chickens, they're, they're pulling them out themselves, behavior or mites. Those are my top two for that, okay? Um, you can treat with insecticides for that, and that's um, pretty straightforward. Uh, again, a veterinarian can help guide you with that, but those insecticides you can actually pick up at you know, Murdoch's or a, you know, a farm store. Roundworms, um, you don't always see roundworms. Again, chicks can come with them. Uh, this is one that you're gonna need a fecal exam, so you can take a sample into a veterinary clinic and they can look and tell you whether or not they're roundworms. Um, and then a veterinarian should make, be making some suggestions as to how to treat them. <laughs> And then the last one is coccidia. Coccidia are super common in stressed birds. So the coccidia is, is ubiquitous, which means that it is present in most birds. And as long as they're healthy, it's not a problem, especially in adult birds. Uh, most commonly you'll see it in like the chicks, especially if they're you know, recently shipped or they're stressed for some other reason. Um, and then there are coccidia stats that you can treat. So you end up putting it in water is the most common thing. And again, that's something that you can pick up at the feed store. You're going to talk to your veterinarian and ask about like what dilution it might look like. All right. I do have a slide about mixing poultry because a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I want to have ducks and I want to have turkeys and I want to have chickens. And there's different requirements for each of these birds. And sometimes they'll have parasites in one species that is lethal in the other species. And so, for example, Heterachus gallinarium is a parasite that chickens can have, and it is lethal in turkeys. So chickens will be fine with it, and you'll not think anything of it. You bring your turkeys in, and suddenly they're all dead. Well, that's what we're talking about. So just being aware that, they're, that it's not all going to look the same. I can't take layer food and feed it to my ducks. Ducks have their very different requirements. So housing for my ducks is also gonna look different. I can't just put them all into my coop. Ducks like water, you know, all those types of things. So just being aware as, as I'm thinking about having more than one species, know what the risks are. Um, again, there's several, I, I would always encourage you if you're gonna go onto the internet to use reputable sites. People have lots of opinions which may not always be based in science. Um, so, you know, you can certainly, if you find veterinary based sites, those are gonna be the best ones in my mind to go. And, and find out about what the risks are between using these, uh, exposing these different species to each other. So I promise we talk about HPAI. You guys may not be that interested in it, but I'll <laughs> tell you what, this is a big deal. Um, unfortunately, this is spread by migrating birds, um, most frequently waterfowl. 
And we have over 200 species of migrating birds that come through Montana. And they just closed down the area between Big Fork and Summers because they're expecting all of these birds to be coming through. And they'll be coming through till about July. And these birds are going to fly over and they're going to poop. And whatever they're pooping on is where this virus is going to be. And if you've paid any attention to the news, um, we've had grizzly bears die of this. Right now they're talking about 3% of the sea lions in Peru are dying of this because birds are dying down there. I mean, again, mm. this is the same population of animals that are going to be coming north and potentially coming over Montana. So this is, I'm afraid, going to be a big deal this year. And truly, all of your birds will die of this if you're not careful. So if you have an outdoor area and you can put some sort of like enclosure above it, some sort of metal or whatever. Again, it just prevents the feces from getting into your area where you have your coops. This is why keeping your boots separate, keeping them housed someplace where if they do poop on it, it's not hitting your boots, that you're using just those um, boots to walk in and out, your clothing, all of those things, it really does matter. It's simply the saliva, mucus, and feces from these animals. And so you may not even know or somebody pooped on me like a week ago and I didn't even think about it. It's on my sweatshirt, I've cleaned it off and I've worn that sweatshirt into my birds and now I've exposed them to this. And this is almost 100% fatal, unfortunately, for our chickens and our turkeys and our, you know, all of these other species. So um, ducks, ducks are fine with this. Ducks don't really seem to be affected by this. They carry it. Um, so like I say, a lot of the waterfall geese ducks um, that we're gonna see coming through, they may not have any problem with it but all of these other species, um, eagles, owls, um, hawks, again, across the country, these are species, pelicans we've seen die of this disease. So um, I think they've had two, maybe three human cases that ha apparently have um, mutated and then infected people. They had one child die in Cambodia, but nobody else has died. So at this point, this doesn't really seem to be a human issue. It's really just more about um, poultry. And so if you think about commercially, needless to say, they're all very concerned about it. And this is why our eggs went from, I don't know, two bucks up to like six bucks. And now they're sort of somewhere up four, just depending upon where you get them from. But this is, again, going to be a problem for years to come. There's a lot of discussion about vaccine um, for our commercial poultry producers. And I just don't know how this is going to and one of my friends is, is a poultry vet, and we had a conversation about this other day, and he said, he said, I don't see how we can survive without getting a vaccine in place, at least for our commercial producers. Is so, there a vaccine now? I'm sorry? Is there a vaccine now? There is, well, the current vaccine that they have out has not really proven efficacious against the, the current mutation that's out there. There's a lot of work being done so my, my do actually work for a pharmaceutical company, um, and that's one of the things that they are doing right now is looking to develop a better vaccine um, for HPAI. Um, so HPAI, like say, most commonly you're going to find a dead animal. Um, you may find some that have the nasal discharge, they may have diarrhea. They're going to be down, they're going to not be eating, um, but death is going to be very quick. Um, past the, when you see the clinical signs, because it impacts the entire bird. <coughs> it's not just like it's one area of the bird that's um, affected. I did want to put some available resources in here. Um, as I said, you know, the internet is full of information, so uh, utilize the appropriate <laughs> resources as you can. The USDA has a lot of information, both about the poultry improvement plan, but also they have some things called Defend the Flock. Um, some of our vet, uh, schools, um, University of Montana, they have poultry extension services, some of them do. So now that I say that I'm not sure the University of Montana does, but it's worth checking because a lot of the ag schools do have this type of resource. And this will be an example of like just if you go on to the website for the USDA, the Defend the, the Flock program. And it, it's this is really intended for like much more for the commercial uh, people, so this would, might be something that they might put on their door of their poultry house, just to remind the, you know their workers as they're walking in, you know, make sure that you're doing these things. But it's again never a bad thing to sort of walk through in your mind and say, okay, am I doing these things to make sure that my birds are staying safe? As I mentioned, there are local resources. So uh, Casey Gates, Dr. Gates, is at Ponderosa. She's the one who's MPIP certified, um, and she'd be happy to help you. 
Um, the vet up at Sea Falls, when I talked to them, they said he does occasionally see chickens. Um, he is up to his eyeballs right now with just dogs and cats, so, um, but they would still try and help you out if you really needed to talk to somebody. And then at Central Valley, again, it's going to be a similar thing. They have a, a doctor there who's um, at least interested in chickens and, and willing to, to talk to you over the phone, if not come out. Right? But hopefully, if you institute a lot of the stuff we talked about, you don't ever have to see people like us. <clears throat> And so my final thoughts, um, just to, to make you aware, you know, the, the USDA is most concerned about these salmonella-associated diseases, certainly HPAI, and the virulent net Newcastle. We didn't talk about that because that may, mainly is a disease of commercial poultry. But again, if you're not buying from somebody who's a reputable seller, you could potentially bring in Newcastle disease. So doing your due diligence, making sure that they're testing for these things, that you have some information about where the chicks are coming from and the chickens are coming from is really important. All right, so I do have a few minutes that I've set aside, about 10 minutes for questions, um, but I hopefully you found this to be useful. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. yes? Can you put up the slide again, the fencing slide with that resource? I didn't catch that. This one or uh, the, the this, okay, yeah, Defenders of Wildlife is the name. So if you Google that, you'd also find this is on their website. Yes. A question on egg pecking. Mm -hmm. Would you can just to peck eggs, and I would think you wouldn't be able to get any eggs. Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, it, uh, unfortunately, you end up calling them, like getting rid of them, because once that behavior starts, it's really hard to break that behavior. Yeah, so as much as you can, again, if you give them space, you give them things to do, there, there's all kinds of little like, entertainment like setups that you can set up these, for chickens these days, just, again, to give them something to do, because that often is boredom. But once they start that behavior, it is so hard to break. I, I just, yeah, uh, more often than not, people end up coloring them. Did everybody hear that question? So I, I yes, go ahead. Uh, so I, I'm unfortunately going to say it depends because it depends upon how much you want to spend for a coop and how you want to set that up and what kind of fencing you want to put in. I mean, all of those can be very expensive. I mean, my one friend spent like $700 for a very nice coop, you know, but it was a lot of money, you know, and then she had, didn't even have chickens yet. So, you know, chicks aren't super expensive, but then you're going to have to put the feed into them and feed prices do vary. You know, it just, again, depends upon what quality of feed you're getting and where you're getting it from. So, I mean, easily you could spend a $1,000 and not blink an eye. So, that's why I say my husband's like, yeah, we never, like, this never worked out well for us. But, again, it was more that it was a hobby. My kids enjoyed having the chickens and we enjoyed having the eggs. So, yes. Yeah, it's fine. Can eggs with um, So, if you just go to the store and get mineral oil. Well, I think somebody just said it. They're touched by everything. You don't have any control over what that biosecurity of that animal looks like before you bring them home. So, and I don't even know where Murdoch's gets their chicks these days. It really does depend year to year. So if they're getting them from a reputable hatchery, you know when they're coming in and you're getting them right away, it may not be so bad. But if they've been there for a week or two, to your point, you know, and, you know, they can't always necessarily tell you where they got them from, depending upon how they're buying. And then disinfection. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, disinfecting tools, equipment, boots. Um, can you use household bleach? Like, just put your boots in a bucket and you just stomp on the bottom and write down with bleach tools. Can you use a bleach disinfectant or is that? Bleach, bleach is a pretty good disinfectant for most, most viruses and bacteria. Um, there are some stronger ones, um, things like Rocal and some of the industrial cleaners, which if you're really concerned, they're going to kill just about everything. And so it just depends upon your level of concern. But overall, bleach is probably a pretty decent one. But, I mean, again, you're not always going to be able to sanitize the inside of your coop with bleach, but you can certainly treat your boots. Um, you know, it's going to eat away at some things, clothing and things like that. So you just need to think about that. One last thing about this space. Mm -hmm. um, if I have an outdoor space and I can connect it to a coop for winter or whatever, 
one if it's in a space that has been previously like dog run and if I lay down concrete or double fence or whatever is that is there going to be cross contamination because the dogs have been there or is there a problem? No, I wouldn't be worried about dogs. Okay. Yeah, I'd be worried about any other bird species. Well, but we yeah, have wild birds. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and again, those, uh, unfortunately, they are potentially could be exposed to HPAI and carry that in the future. But, you know, at this time of year, we're not having a ton of that because the birds haven't started to migrate yet. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, Murdoch's Columbia Falls, when they get the chicks in, they're gone within 15 minutes. Yeah. And um, yeah. we're planning on having uh, chick covered chicken tractors mm -hmm. uh, in our field, which is close to Cali Lake, close to a creek. So you're saying we can expect the migrating birds to contaminate that field? Yep, so if you're moving that tractor from place to place, that is a huge risk. So if you could you know, try and limit that and then put like some sort of you know, roofing over it, that would be a better situation. I, I'm just afraid this year is going to be awful for HPAI. And did you say it was a, a, a migrating party where the risk goes down? So after July, the birds pretty much stop migrating, but unfortunately, it doesn't mean that our risk is stopped. Because what then happens is they're exposing other birds that are here, right. and they may or may not die, and then they become carriers, and then they're spreading it. So it, that's why I say I just don't really know what it's going to look like, but this is why I'm so concerned this year. I know. Just a bad year. Just a bad year. Yeah. When they raise the birds, will that meat have the HPAI in it? And would the humans ingest that? And so. Well, and so this is a concern. So those three grizzly bears that died, they think probably ate an infected bird and then developed HPAI. So that certainly is a risk. I mean, I wouldn't ever say go out and if you find a dead goose, go ahead and, and eat it. Like that, that just is not a good plan. There's so many things it could have died of. Um, but yeah, if you're going duck hunting, it could be an issue. We just don't really know yet. So far, the human exposure has been more inhalation. So the people that have had it have been around infected poultry and inhaled it. It hasn't been through. I, I mean, and again, over time, could it be an issue? I'm just sort of thinking out loud. Um, our, our GI system, because we have, we're full of acid, typically that will break things down. But if you're eating, you're also breathing, you know. There's no white paper. There is not right now. Mm -mm. Uh, unfortunately, like we, we just like COVID, like we're learning so much more now that it's been like three and a half, four years. It, it, we just don't have that that information yet. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there a designated way to uh, dispose of the dead birds from the flu? Is there burning them? Okay. Burning them. If you take them to the landfill, that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you find a dead bird, the best thing you can do is is burn them. Okay. Yeah. The good question though. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. So the, the poop that comes from the sky from these birds, um, how long does the bird take in the poop? I mean, so if you had a tractor poop that you could move, could you do it in August or September if that poop is dead now? Do you know it's a great question, and I it just depends. And that, unfortunately, is, I think I gave you that same answer for your last question, but it, it depends upon moisture. It depends upon, like you were saying, sunlight. It depends upon temperature. So it, over time, yes, it will break down. But I don't really know what that timeline's going to be. So if we have enough rain, it might keep it moist enough where the sun doesn't desiccate it, and it's still viable. Yeah. But a great question. Yes. I have a question on feed. Do you have certain brands of feed like? And you were mentioning, um, you know, getting the feed that has the minerals in it versus kind of separating out the minerals. I was just curious on brand. I, I don't have a specific brand. Again, the, the bottom line is, I, I have to say, when we had chicken, I always look for the cheapest. I can't deny, but I always look for that balanced, <laughs> yeah. you know, ration. So. Yeah, I wasn't feeding just one brand because it really just depended. You know, if I could get this one for thirty-eight dollars and that one's fifty, well, yeah, right. Yeah, this one's on sale this week. You know, yeah. <laughs> right. so anybody else? Well, I really appreciate your time. Yes, go ahead. One more. So if you have, um, if you already have an established block, so you get some more checks, right? You get them all ready to go. 
what is the timeline between when they're introduced to each other before they can actually be integrated into your Block. Yep, it's a great question. And if you have that ability to let them separate themselves, then it can be earlier. If it's if you don't have that ability, then you really want them to be pretty decent size. So I mean, it might be three months, three and a half months, where they can start to defend themselves a little bit better. If they're these little tiny guys that are just getting their feathers, you know, they're they're it's all. You know, yeah, and they've got nothing to defend. <laughs> so just think about it that way, okay? All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate you guys coming, and I hope you guys get lots of seeds. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.